Therians. Uh, this is a crazy one, guys. Mr. Reagan. All right, before we start, I'm going to shamelessly pitch you my merch, but I have good reason. The left has a monopoly on cool design, and I want to design some cool stuff for our side. And yes, I know that most of this stuff isn't exactly the stuff that the typical Christian conservative Republican is going to like, but I love it. I designed what I'm calling my Trump collection. It's six original Trump designs, one, two, three, four, five, six, plus a repurposed ad from Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, which I thought was incredibly cool. So if you like this stuff, buy some of it. Or if not, you know what, just get a Mr. Reagan t-shirt or an America First mug or something like that. All right, enough shameless hawking of Mr. Reagan merch. Let's start the insanity. Hi, my name is Asa. I am a member of a DID system and I'm also a bearded vulture Therian. I have two questions. One is for other Therians, uh, specifically bird Therians. Um, and the other question is for other systems who have Therian system members. So first question for other bird Therians, what are some things you do that help you feel more connected to your stereotype? Like I know that for people whose stereotypes are four-legged, they can do quadrobics and that helps them a lot. Um, but obviously that's not applicable to bird Therians. I also want to clarify for anyone who doesn't know, um, quadrobics does not automatically equal Therians. People can do quadrobics and not be a Therian. So that's my first question, how to feel more connected to bird stereotypes. Um, and second question is for systems with Therian altars, do these altars appear human in a world or do they appear as their stereotype in our world? Or is it kind of a combo situation? Like we have someone in our system who is both a guy and a vulture at the same time. We don't consider him a Therian because he doesn't consider himself a Therian. Um, he just kind of exists as both of those things at once. Is that how Therian altars work in you guys' systems? Just very curious about how other people experience this kind of thing. Wow. Okay. That is, uh, that's a lot. That is a lot. And, uh, this is a part of a larger community of lunatics called other kin who, whom I have discussed on this channel previously. And I still find this insane. Like I'm still shocked by this stuff when I see it. Uh, the Therian trend has become popular enough that seven months ago, this phenomenon was featured on the YouTube channel WikiHow. The video currently has 77,000 views. Now, on the one hand, I don't really mind this up to a certain age. This person is obviously far too old to be playing make-believe. Uh, this is a fairly typical game that children play. You know, it's like they, they, they're they pretending to be animals or pirates, or in my case, when I was a little boy, I often pretended to be Superman, right? I, we would play superheroes. I'd be Superman. My neighbor would be Batman, this sort of thing. And I'm not sure at what point somebody becomes too old to play make-believe, but it's certainly got to be something like nine or 10, right? When, once you start getting toward your teenage years, you're a little too old to be playing pretend. At that point, you know, it's about time that you started trying to live in the real world. But in our society today, people are remaining children for a lot longer. And some people will point to men playing video games in their 40s, things like that. And look, I don't necessarily think that that is an indication of somebody being childlike or childish. You know, I still like being told a great story, whether that be in a movie or a great television series or just reading a book or from a video game or whatever it might be. You know, I think jumping into the world of fiction occasionally you know, in your free time, it's a bit of fun. Uh, even cosplay. I don't think cosplay is necessarily a childish type of thing to do. I think indulging in fiction in these ways is a kind of like a very healthy indulgence in nostalgia. Indulging in nostalgia, I believe, requires the acceptance of reality because it requires that you recognize that what you're doing is fictional. You're engaging with fiction. The Therians, on the other hand, or the other kin, this is more like a delusion. You know, this is the difference between acknowledging the ugly truth and accepting the beautiful lie. And I talk about this all the time on the show. I talk about it on Twitter all the time. It's sort of my thing now. The difference between acknowledging the ugly truth and accepting the beautiful lie. But where does this attraction to the beautiful lie come from? Well, some people want to be special, but they're not special. And it's hard to become special because that means you have to do something exceptional. And doing exceptional things is difficult. It's much easier to pretend you're a dog. The ugly truth versus the beautiful lie. And I truly believe that so many people want to just 
accept beautiful lies in our society today, that this could very well be the downfall of Western civilization. I'll explain all of this in one moment. First, of course, I have to sell you something. You'd have to be living under a rock not to have heard that gold has been hitting record highs. That is quite an achievement since gold has been used as money for thousands of years. I'm going to add to Bitcoin gold. Gold's had a tremendous move here. I think it was might have been off today, but it's had a tremendous move. But why is it surging in 2024? Gold thrives when everything else looks shaky, like the dollar, the national debt, overpriced markets, the cost of living, global wars, and an election that will determine whether America makes a comeback or fades into broken border bureaucratic obscurity. Is gold still a hedge against inflation? I think you could argue yes. Gold has traditionally been looked at <laughs> as something Bitcoin. to diversify your portfolio, own a little yeah, bit of gold, gold, and now... Priority Gold wants to help you hedge the markets, the swamp, the squad, the Fed, the woke mob, and the Washington insiders who want to destroy your savings. Call 469-405-4140 to learn about gold and get up to $2,500 in free silver, which CNBC suggests may have a bigger upside than gold. You can also text Mr. Reagan to that same number, 469-405-4140, for a free gold report, and again, up to $2,500 in free silver. Don't wait on this. Barron says gold continues to climb. The Wall Street Journal sees more green lights for gold. And the Asia Times says investors are now buying gold as insurance because the likelihood of a black swan event is rising. Look, you can do nothing and hope for the best. We saw how that worked out last time around. Or you can protect yourself from Joe Biden's dangerous new world. Call 469-405-4140 or you can text that same number, Mr. Reagan, MR Reagan, all one word, 469-405-4140. Call them right now. These guys are going to tell you how to hedge with gold and you can get up to $2,500 in free silver. Now, I am a very nostalgic guy. And although I've never done anything like cosplay myself, I understand it. I understand when people collect toys from the 1980s. Again, I don't collect toys, but I've seen documentaries about people who are like obsessed with collecting, say, Star Wars figurines. And I actually understand where that comes from. A lot of people's lives, they kind of get boring when they get older. They're stuck in the same nine to five job. They've got to look at the same four walls every day. They got to say hi to the same coworkers. And they start to dream about a time in which they didn't have the responsibilities of an adult back when they could just have fun with their friends anytime, day or night. They just jump on their bicycles and they would ride. Maybe they'd go hunt for hidden treasure or play a game of basketball. Many adults, they don't have these luxuries anymore. And they look back at a time when they had that pure, unconditional love from their parents, from their grandparents. And they had the best entertainment possible in the history of the world, sitting down for a bowl of cereal and watching Saturday morning cartoons. Now, I've met people who grew up in the 50s and and they are super nostalgic for that time. I've met people who grew up in the 60s, also super nostalgic for that time. My buddy, Sebastian Gorka, he is super nostalgic for the 1970s because that's when he grew up. And I myself am super nostalgic for the 1980s. And I met people who are born after me and they're super nostalgic for the 90s. And I think this kind of thing is totally reasonable. It's rational. It is healthy. Of course, you're going to look back fondly at a time in your life that was carefree and wonderful and full of fun and love and family. But this, what this girl is doing, this Therian thing, this other kin, this is something else. This is different. I don't think that pretending you're an animal when you're a high school age student or a college age student I don't think this is expressing some form of nostalgia. I think that this is a way to bury yourself in your comforter on your bed, put pillows over your face, and hide from the world. And to be honest, I understand that impulse as well. But unlike the expression of nostalgia, this belief in oneself as a Therian, of identifying as a dog, you know, this seems to be an active attempt at denying reality. And look, I don't know how deeply these people actually believe that they're an animal, but this is clearly an extension of the transgender movement. And I think that that is the problem here. The transgender activists will insist that a man can be a woman just because he thinks he's a woman. A lot of us disagree with that, obviously, and we'll say, well, no, you, you can't be a woman just because you think you're a woman. You have to be born with the biological makeup of a woman. Just slapping on a bit of lipstick and a pair of high heels, that doesn't turn you into a woman. But because so many people in our society have insisted that, yes, in fact, slapping on some lipstick and a pair of heels, that does turn you into a woman. And because many children are now taught this stuff, I think there is this new trend to be able to call yourself whatever you want. And of course, the gender pronoun thing also contributes to this. I go by this and that pronouns because this most precisely represents 
what I am in the world. I did a video about this a while ago. Uh, some adolescents, some college age folks, there is this trend now of people becoming obsessed with these TikTok videos about mental illness. And these people become convinced, they've convinced themselves that they are mentally ill because the symptoms seem to describe them very well. And this, of course, can be disastrous for mental health because in many cases, these people, they do not have the mental health disorders that they think they do from watching these videos, but they're convinced that they have these, uh, these mental illnesses. And now I think they adopt a new mental disorder, right? Which is that they become convinced that they have a mental disorder. This is, of course, delusion, right? They become deluded and they give themselves a mental illness in a way. We do not want people being tricked into thinking that they are the opposite gender of their biological sex. And we do not want people being tricked into thinking that they're a dog. But this is, of course, the way the world is going. It's a strange side effect of the internet. You know, you get all this information flying around. You got these people, maybe they don't got a lot of friends or maybe they want to distinguish themselves from the rest of society in some way, you know, because they want to feel special. And, you know, these people are going to be attracted to these bizarre trends. And look, I know a lot of you guys, they pro probably have tattoos out there. And I don't necessarily think a tattoo is the worst thing in the world. However, I do think that the trend of getting like the tattoo sleeves, I think that was actually pretty terrible because this kind of tattoo, you can't laser that off, right? I mean, it used to be that a girl would turn 18 and she'd get like a little, you know, Looney Tunes character or something on her shoulder. And if she wanted, she could eventually get it lasered off. There's no lasering that off. Right? That is, that's permanent. And I think that when somebody does something that irrevocably alters their body because of a trend, I mean, they're stuck with that for the rest of their lives because they wanted to follow a trend. And you know, that's no longer trendy. And this was probably one of the ugliest tattoo trends I have ever seen. I mean, this was horrible. And now you got a lot of girls walk around probably in their, like maybe their thirties and they got these patches on their leg. It's no longer trendy, but they're stuck with this. You know, it's a pretty big tattoo. It was a very short lived trend and now they're stuck with this. I mean, of course, none of this is as bad as cutting your penis off because of a trend, you know, because it's trendy to be transgender now, uh, but it's all bad. I think trends that encourage people to do things that they will later regret are all kind of bad. And look, you might not think that pretending to be a dog for a couple of years is the worst thing that can happen to a person. And I would agree with you, but there are going to be a few people who because they're pretending to be a dog, they become so humiliated that, you know, they're in danger of potentially becoming quite depressed and committing unfortunate acts of self-harm. And look, I don't want to see that. Okay, I don't want to see that. I know many of you out there are going to be like, oh, you know what? It's Darwinian. This is natural selection. This is survival of, of the fittest. If somebody is to leave this earthly realm because of their humiliation of their own idiotic choices, because they wanted to follow a stupid trend and post it online, the human race will be better off for it. But I disagree because Look, you know, I see the girl in this video. I see some folks who get stupid tattoos. I get, you know, I see people who jump into the transgender movement head first, and I see them eventually wake up from this stuff and regret it. And I don't think these people are necessarily stupid. Everyone is susceptible to being tricked and being lied to, and everybody is susceptible to following into a trend that they think is cool at one point and they're later embarrassed by it. I mean, when I was a kid, we were pretty poor, so we were too poor to follow any trends, so I was spared this particular indignity just because of poverty. However, when I was growing up in Oregon, there was one trend uh, among the boys who played basketball and I played basketball when I was a kid. So uh, I ended up doing this thing that was to shave uh, lines in the side of your head. And I actually have a family picture somewhere in which I have these lines shaved into the side of my head. And this is something that no white man should ever do. Okay. But my family to this day, they pull that picture out from time to time and they have a good laugh at my expense. And you know, it's a bit of fun at this point. And honestly, I think those kind of hairstyles are popular again. So there's probably some people that would see that picture and go, Oh man, that was kind of cool. Uh, but no, no, it does not look cool. It looks ridiculous. But, but the point I'm trying to make is that we all make stupid mistakes and there can be dire consequences for making stupid mistakes. And the truth is that not everybody needs to make stupid mistakes like this. They can be spared from making life altering decisions if they're raised right. And even if they're not raised right, we can create a culture. We can create a society that does not encourage people to do this stuff, to, to make life altering decisions and doing things that will eventually, they will find humiliating. In the 1980s, we had a bullying problem, right? A lot of people think that we need to bring bullying back because now maybe we don't have enough bullying. I'm not so sure that's the answer, but instead of bullying, let's replace that idea with the concept of shame, right? Historically, and I don't mean the 1980s, I mean pretty much the entire history 
of the existence of human civilization. Uh, there has been this concept of shame. If you did something that was shameful, this was deeply embarrassing. People would avoid bringing shame to themselves and their families. This still exists in many cultures. We actually tend to condemn more primitive cultures like Muslim cultures in the Middle East for going a little bit overboard with this whole shame thing. In some cultures, they feel like if you bring shame to the family, the family has the right to execute you. No problem. However, now in America, we've gone too far the other way. And I think, you know, for a lot of European history, we lived in this perfect balance between shame as being something that people actually had to contend with in society, and also a sort of social tolerance for lifestyles and ideas and interests that were a little out of the mainstream. Uh, now, I go back to nerd culture of the 1980s when I was a kid growing up, and nerds were called nerds. It was a little bit too cruel, perhaps, and these nerdy kids were already socially awkward, and then, they, of course, they felt even worse because they were being ridiculed by their peers. But if you were a little bit nerdy, this kind of ridicule then pressured you into trying to be cooler. And I think that that's the natural way of things. And I think that's okay. It's sort of like if you know you're not particularly good at your job and you're at risk of getting fired, you will probably try to improve yourself at that job. And that's a good thing. In almost every aspect of life, a little bit of social pressure to improve yourself is a good thing. Today, we have all these like nerdy guys who come up and they and they, they never really feel pressure to improve. And I think it's because we coddle these guys. And then they end up listening to some guy like Andrew Tate, who's a complete idiot. Uh, and this guy is the guy that they turn to for self-confidence because he's kind of a nerd, right? And he comes out and he says, this is how you be confident. You'd be an asshole, basically. And everybody's like, yeah, I'm awesome. And it's like, okay, well, Maybe, maybe if you just had a little bit of social pressure early on, you would have improved by yourself and you wouldn't need to follow that guy's advice. Without some kind of an incentive, either positive or negative, people don't tend to change for the better. And I think that we decided in our culture, or at least the left-wing moms have decided this because, you know, left-wing moms, they control a lot of the culture. They've decided that, you know, kids shouldn't be under any kind of pressure whatsoever, right? At some point, there was this collective decision by all the leftist moms of the world that no kid was ever going to feel any kind of discomfort ever. Throughout the entirety of their childhood, no discomfort ever. Even beyond, into college, no discomfort. Even when they become adults, you know, these women, they were going to coddle these kids right up to, into middle age. You know, my, my mom had this friend when I was a kid. Uh, and one day we were sitting in the car and we kind of had some time to waste. So we're joking around about this woman and her son. Her son happened to be a friend of mine. And we came up with this little repartee, this little jokey conversation about how this woman would uh, roll up at my buddy's high school uh, because, you know, she was still breastfeeding him at the time. That's not real. I just thought that was a funny idea. And she'd yell out, honey, it's time for lunch. And he'd yell back, oh, mom, not in front of the guys. We had a good laugh about that. I don't know why. We came up with this idea that she was still breastfeeding her kids. But, you know, she was that kind of mom, you know. So we th that's how we, we came up with a joke like that. I don't know. And look, I mean, I certainly hope that there are no mothers out there still breastfeeding their children in their high school years. But the way some of these kids act, maybe that's going on. I don't know. Look, I understand that life is tough. I understand. Uh, there are some people out there that are very sensitive. They can't handle life as well as other people who are born with maybe a little bit more toughness, naturally. You know, it's just like that some people are naturally, they're, they're good at athletics, they're good at sports. Some people are naturally, they're good at math. Some people are naturally good at acting or entertaining or writing. You know, different people have different talents and some people just can't handle life in the real world. It's tough for them. However, I do not believe that hiding from the real world is the proper solution for this. I think that this will only exacerbate the problem. It'll prolong the problem. Facing the real world, even incrementally, it's going to improve somebody's life a hell of a lot better than just hiding from it for the rest of their lives. This is the difference between the ugly truth and the beautiful lie. The beautiful lie spares the leftist from having to have an awkward conversation about his sister's husband, Greg, who's just decided that he's a woman. The beautiful lie lets Democrat voters believe that immigrants flooding into this country illegally is a good thing. The beautiful lie spares the leftist from having to think about the difficult questions around why black men commit so much crime in this country. The beautiful lie allows them to be ignorant of that fact altogether. The beautiful lie permits the 300-pound woman to feel perfectly content ordering the second slice of pizza or the third dessert and ratcheting that scale up to 400 pounds. Not only can she feel perfectly content doing that, she'll feel confident doing that. She'll feel confident with her body. I mean, maybe she dies at 40, but she felt confident. A truly indoctrinated leftist could stand atop the rubble of a world they destroyed and still point to a black conservative and call him a racist. That is the power of the beautiful lie. And you know, solving these problems 
it's not that difficult. Stopping these kids from believing that they're Therians, it's not actually that tough. All you need to do is set appropriate examples in the various aspects of our culture. If the federal government took a position saying that transgenderism is an expression of a mental illness, that would be a great step in the right direction. If movies and TV shows started to present traditional family values as good things like they used to do, that would be a step in the right direction. If universities stop brainwashing kids into thinking communism was a great idea and that straight white men are pure evil, that would be a step in the right direction. If parents stopped allowing school administrators to hire these extremely woke teachers in high schools, middle schools, and even elementary schools, that would be a massive step in the right direction. Thank goodness for libs of TikTok. And what's my intention here? What's my motivation? What do I want to see America become? A lot of conservatives online, they seem to want to turn every guy in the country into a cowboy and every woman into a housewife. And I don't think that's necessarily the answer. I don't even think that's remotely possible. So what do I want to see? My idealized version of America is a populace that is, for the most part, normal. And what do I mean by normal? A lot of people think they got a problem with this word, right? They say, well, there's no such thing as normal. Uh, yeah, there is, right? Normal is not being super tough or super weak. It's just being normal. For the most part, you can handle most things that come at you in regular life, a normal level of stress. And if you have to deal with a high level of stress for a short amount of time, you can figure out how to deal with that too. And during the good times, when things are easy, you thrive. And in the tough times, when things are difficult, you survive. Right now, I feel like we have a generation of kids who are going through good times. You know, they have money, they have a roof over their head, they can eat as much as they want, and they seem to be barely surviving. Now, to some degree, I don't know if this is a problem that is actually fixable. This may actually be the downfall of civilization. Because I think a lot of this problem stems from the great wealth that we enjoy in Western civilization. I've been traveling a bit in Asia, and the people here are very poor. And the people do what they need to do to survive here. They don't have the luxury of indulging in delusions about the world. They gotta make enough money to survive the next day. They gotta make enough money to eat. They gotta make enough money to pay for their gas. They can't be going around going, I think I'm a dog today. And as some of you know, I'm intimately familiar with the Russian culture. I've known a lot of Russians, Ukrainians, Moldovans, Albanians, Latvians, Bulgarians, Belarusians, etc. And life in Eastern Europe is quite a bit more difficult than life in America. And again, it's the same story over there. They don't have the luxury of saying, I think today I'm gonna pretend to be a dog. They, they can't indulge in that kind of fantasy because they got work to do. They gotta make enough money to get to that next level to give themselves a good life. In America, I think that so many people have it so comfortable that they actually need to do something to make their lives more interesting. And so then we end up with situations like this. And so here's where I'm going with this. I fear that there is no turning back. We cannot, in good conscience, reduce the quality of life of Americans, no matter how hard Joe Biden tries to do it. I cannot sit here and say to you that I feel morally justified with this idea that, you know, Americans need to make less money. They need to have a lower quality of life. Of course not. I think that we have reached a threshold for our quality of life that it's become so high, our wealth has become so great, the challenges we face are so insignificant, and our level of comfort is so dang high that our culture has become something that will necessarily induce this kind of lunacy. In 1973, a researcher by the name of John B. Calhoun published an article called Death Squared. In this article, he revealed an experiment in which he had created a mouse utopia. This utopia he called Universe 25. It was an enormous playpen for mice in which there was unlimited food, unlimited water, and there was no fear of predators or disease. This utopia, turned into a nightmare. And the males in this last generation of mice in this utopia, Calhoun called the beautiful ones. These males were what you might have called in the 19th century dandies, total narcissists that just sat around and groomed themselves all day. And the females of this last generation were, according to Calhoun, unfit to rear young. Finally, there was phase D, which Calhoun entitled the death phase. This phase was characterized largely by an entire generation of young who had been rejected by their mothers early and forced to leave the nest, and they were therefore unable to exhibit normal social behavior. This manifested in numerous ways. The females of this generation had far fewer children, and those that did have children lacked the maternal instincts necessary to raise them beyond weaning. Calhoun goes on to describe the males of this generation. Quote, Male counterparts to these non-reproducing females were soon dubbed the beautiful ones. 
They never engaged in sexual approaches toward females, and they never engaged in fighting, and so they had no wound or scar tissue. Thus, their pelage remained in excellent condition. Their behavioral repertoire became largely confined to eating, drinking, sleeping, and grooming, none of which carried any social implications beyond that represented by contiguity of bodies." Unquote. As the last mice with reproductive instincts aged beyond their fertility, Calhoun declared that the last male would die around day 1780 of the experiment, effectively rendering the colony dead as it would be unable to produce any more young. And although Calhoun's experiments were meant to observe the effects of overpopulation, what I think his experiments ended up exposing was the tendency for psychopathy when all basic needs are met. We live in Universe 25. America today is the mouse utopia. We have all our basic needs met, and many in our society have no purpose in life. And so we end up with people like these Therians who pretend they're dogs. And I don't think there's any going back. So I think, firstly, we need to push society back away from this immorality, this anything goes culture. We need to reassert some moral boundaries. And I think that the reaction against por pornographic books in school libraries, this is emblematic of that effort. And secondly, I, I think we're going to have to learn how to deal with some of these nutcases living among us in society. I don't know how we can entirely prohibit the disease of woke psychopathy eventually infecting the entirety of society, but we've got to try. And you know, I guess that's my job. And I do believe that the conservative movement, our movement, can save this nation. We can save civilization. We just have to fight like hell. And in order to fight like hell, you need to go to my Teespring and buy all of my overpriced stuff. Like I said, I've got some really great new t-shirts and mugs. I'm really proud of these. So go have a look at that stuff or just send me money via the super thanks here on YouTube so we can keep trying to save the world. These videos aren't always great, but as I say, every once in a while, I produce a gem. All right, thanks for watching. And remember, it's not that a liberal friends are ignorant, it's just they know so much that is not so. Good night. Together, with God's help, we can and will resolve the problems which now confront us. And after all, why shouldn't we believe that? We are Americans.